There is a book. Okay. So first we have um, the photographer taking the photo. Okay. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the FCCJ. I'm your moderator today, um, Andy Sharp from the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, today's guest, Te Yong Ho, if my pronunciation is correct. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> is a former North Korean diplomat who held posts in Denmark, Sweden, and the UK. And when he was the deputy ambassador in London, he created headlines around the world in 2006 by escaping to South Korea with his family in one of the biggest defections um, to, to South Korea from the north. Um, as you can see, he's holding up these books. Um, so last week, Bungay Junju published a Japanese translation of his book about working as a diplomat for North Korea. Um, it's translated as a password from the third floor. And in the book, he talks about some of the secrets of North Korean diplomacy and sheds new light on the Kim family. Of course, the North Korean regime didn't take a liking to this book being published, calling him some pretty rude names. Um, Anyway, to cut a long story short, because we're sort of short on time today, um, the visit's very timely today, I think, with um, the big uh, news that Xi Jinping is heading to Pyongyang right now to meet uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un. And of course, I would like to ask Mr. Taya about this, what his thoughts are about the, um, the situation between South Korea, sorry, North, North Korea and China, and just some general thoughts um, on the whole uh, denuclearization process um, on the Korean Peninsula. So anyway, without further ado, um, Mr. Tay is going to give us a short 10-minute um, um, introduction, maybe talking about his book, and then we'll hope to open the floor for 40, 45 minutes or so of Q&A. So, um, Mr. Tay, onagashi mas, after you. Oh, thank you very much and very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself shortly and then I'll tell uh, uh, something about my book and then I'll be open to any kind of questions you raised me. Uh, as uh, Andy introduced, you know, I worked as the deputy ambassador of North Korea to uh, UK until the summer of 2016 and uh, the questions which uh, I was bombarded when I first arrived in South Korea was uh, why and how uh, I defected uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, so the reason is very simple uh, because uh, I thought that the way Kim Jong-un regime uh, has taken is wrong and uh, fortunately uh, I was able to uh, bring my first son to London in 2014 which was a very fortunate I think God blessed me so that you know uh, all the members of my family could join uh, in London so I thought that that was the last opportunity for myself and for the members of my family, my wife and my two sons who could escape uh, North Korea and as a father I thought that it is my uh, duty to cut off the chain of a slavery uh, 
for my sons. I thought that the Kim Jong-un regime would not end up easily. So if the life of myself and my family uh, continued, then it would take uh, another long year. And uh, for my sons who attended uh, British education in London, uh, it could be a very difficult and miserable life if I forced them to back to the, the Pyongyang. So that is the basic of my, the reason of the defection. And after I defected to South Korea, I wrote uh, this book. This is the Korean version. And uh, at that time, I thought that it is my duty to tell the world how uh, Kim Jong-un regime uh, is functioning, what is the true picture of North Korea's decision-making process. So before this book, uh, there was no book or no information about the uh, third uh, storied secretariat, which was a hidden uh, organization uh, and which supported uh, the Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un uh, leadership uh, in North Korea. And when I uh, opened about those, those decision-making process in North Korea through this book, uh, Kim Jong-un, I don't know why, he opened his uh, third storied secretariat for the first time in North Korea's history. So now everybody knows where it is, how it is functioning, what is the main mission of that organization in North Korean uh, structure. And even before this book, uh, the majority of North Korean people even did not know the existence of this uh, huge organization in the Workers' Party of Korea and in North Korea's political structure. So I am very proud that I was the first one who opened about the, uh, the structure of the true North Korea's uh, decision-making process. And I'm very happy that at this time, uh, Japanese publishing house uh, Mune Tsunsu published a Japanese version in last week, so uh, uh, my the purpose of current visit to Japan is to tell uh, about uh, this book, so that uh, I do wish that more uh, Japanese people read this book and understand North Korea. North Korea and Japan is a uh, very near neighbor. But uh, to my impression so far, uh, there is no enough information about North Korea. There is no any detailed uh, communications between North Korea and Japan. And as a former North Korean diplomat, it is my first visit. <coughs> In North Korea, as for North Korean diplomats, there are four countries which are most difficult to visit. Number one is South Korea. Very few North Korean diplomats were allowed to visit South Korea. Number two is Japan. And number three is Israel. Number four is United States of America. So before I, my defection to South Korea, I never visited these four countries in my life. I visited most of the European countries, but I was not able to visit South Korea, Japan, Israel, and America. And now I'm a free man. That's why so far I visited America, and now this is Japan. I haven't visited Israel yet, but I hope. So my wish to visit these four forbidden countries is almost realizing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Mr. Tay. So I'm going to open this up to questions in a moment. Just, I'm going to take
take this opportunity to ask you a question myself, if that's okay. Yeah. So, based on one, you know, one question each, please. So one question if, each. If you ask two or three at one time, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll keep this to one question. Um, it's very broad, but given the Xi Kim summit that's going to take place over the next couple of days, what do you expect to see? Um, coming out of this summit, um, you know, obviously from a North Korean perspective, using your diplomatic background. So, what do you see as the outcome of this summit, especially ahead of Xi's meeting with Trump in Osaka next week? Mm. I think it's uh, the question is looks very simple, but the answer must be very long. <laughs> yes, first of all, uh, uh, the the main purpose for a Kim Jong Un regime. Uh, for negotiation is to uh, keep North Korea as a new nuclear state in this region. There is no doubt about it. But it is. Uh, it seems very difficult to keep uh, this nuclear uh, status in this region because of the uh, UN uh, sanctions. That's why. Uh, Kim regime is looking for uh, any kind of you know possibility to buy the time, because uh, uh, what as a diplomat, what all North Korean diplomats were taught and were educated is that uh, America uh, has already acknowledged one Islamic country to be a nuclear power state. So if you compare Pakistan and North Korea to be a nuclear state. North Korea, uh, North Korea still thinks that it might be more easier than Pakistan uh, to be a new nuclear state in this region. So basically, they think that there is a possibility. And, but the point is how. So that's why uh, the Kim Jong-un regime wants to uh, turn this denuclearization of process into nuclear disarmament process. That is the policy principle of uh, North Korea. So it seemed working until uh, Hanoi summit. Before Hanoi summit, when uh, Kim Jong-un reached an agreement with President Trump, it was a great success unexpected a success to North Korean diplomacy. If you read the texts of Singapore agreement, it was clearly stated that the trust building measures must take place first before any significant measures for denuclearization. So after Singapore agreement, all North Korean medias claimed that North Korea finally became a strategic state in this region because of Singapore Agreement. If you read the Singapore Agreement, it is clearly stated that first improvement of bilateral relations between DPRK and America, the second permanent structural peace arrangement in Korean Peninsula, and in third, only thirdly, there is a mentioning of denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, but there is no any specific mentioning of denuclearization of North Korea. So the interpretation of this Singapore agreement is quite different between America and North Korea. That is one of the main reasons why President Trump broke the Hanoi summit. If President Trump made any deal in Hanoi with Kim Jong-un, then that Hanoi deal could be one of the process of implementing Singapore agreement, which is really a diplomatic failure to Trump administration. So now after Hanoi's the, a failure, now North Korea is uh, planning a new strategy uh, to realize their own uh, ambition to be the new nuclear state in this region. So the question is how? how what, what is North Korea preparing? They reviewed the American policy in Hanoi and in Singapore. In Hanoi and Singapore, American administration 
avoided to discuss directly the issues of already made nuclear missiles. North Korea claimed that they completed the process of making nuclear and ICBMs. But in Singapore and in Hanoi, the most of the focuses were on the North Korea's past nuclear history, not the present nuclear missiles. So North Korea wants to keep this kind of uh, the process and framework at the next third round of talk. So on before Xi Jinping's meeting, on the 4th of June, the spokesman of North Korean Foreign Ministry issued a statement. And in this statement, it is clearly stated that North Korea wants to drop its own unilateral demand. And on the meanwhile, they asked American side to do the same. And they urged American side to look for a new approach for the solution of this, uh, the matters. So what does it mean? Because the, the currently uh, Trump administration is uh, advocating that North Korea's denuclearization process should be solved by, a, by way of inclusively and the comprehensively. But on the meanwhile, America did not clearly say that what should discuss first, whether it is nuclear missiles or those hidden uranium enrichment facilities. So that's why now Kim Jong-un is trying to use Xi Jinping's visit to deliver his new approach to uh, American side. So what North Korea's a kind of compromise at the coming uh, third summit? To my impression, Kim Jong-un may, may open or he may abandon those five nuclear uranium enrichment facilities which President Trump asked in Hanoi summit. And if President Trump <laughs> accepts this new offer from Kim Jong-un and make any kind of deal, then Kim Jong-un can avoid the discussion of already made nuclear missiles. If Kim Jong-un succeeds in convincing President Trump to make a deal on a past North Korea's nuclear facilities and succeed, succeed in keeping the current nuclear missiles for another few years, then it would mean to North Korea that North Korea can be accepted as a new nuclear state in this region. That is the basic, I think, game plan for North Korea. Uh, and they want to use the President Xi Jinping as a kind of a mediator in G20. President Xi Jinping is coming to uh, Japan next week. And President Xi Jinping may deliver this new offer directly to President Trump. So now it's up to President Trump whether she would accept this new proposal or not. Thank you very <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, I'm opening the floor to questions now. As uh, Mr. Tay said, one question, keep it short. We'll start with Alistair over there. I'm going to come down here. Uh, Alastair Gale with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you for coming here. Um, I'd like to ask about the experience of North Korean diplomats such as yourself. Uh, you talked about um, your own defection was a decision um, for the sake of your family. Uh, we've seen uh, in recent months some movements for other defections, possible defections in Europe. I'm thinking of Spain and Italy. Um, 
I wonder if you could help us understand, for, for North Korean diplomats, what is, are there uh, approaches made uh, with offers to defect? And if so, who do those offers come from? Or are there decisions to defect, uh, obviously in your case it was you know, for your family, do they come from the individuals, or is it a combination of both, if it's possible to generalize? Thank mm. you. Uh, to my impression, uh, so far there was no any clear offer. I don't think there was any offer from uh, any uh, country to uh, North Korean diplomats uh, to defect. I think all governments are very cautious uh, on the, that kind of, I think, approach to uh, North Korean uh, diplomats. For instance, the the latest defection by North Korean Chinese affair to Italy uh, was also a kind of, you know, his own uh, the decision. There was no even a clear, I think, uh, cooperation from Italian side or whatever. And you know that as soon as uh, he defected, uh, he was not even able to take uh, his daughter out uh, from the embassy, and as soon as uh, he defected, the North Korean uh, the, the, uh, the embassy in Italy uh, sent his daughter back immediately after his defection. So that's why through this process, we I can easily understand that there was no any you know uh, the offer or any communication pre communication between those planned defectors and the authority, resident authorities, or any third parties. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. So we'll go to Peter here, and then come to this gentleman, and then hope to get around. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, Peter Lang, and I'm freelance at the moment. Um, when the talks began between Trump and, and Kim um, um, in the midst of it, uh, John Bolton cited the example of regime change in Libya, which is, was interpreted in some quarters as a great setback to the talks. So in your opinion, could you s say is John Bolton part of the problem or part of the solution? Mm. North Korea's diplomacy is based on three principles for several decades. The first, the first one uh, is America cannot attack North Korea. It, it's a kind of, you know, long established theory. Even though North Korea is saying that they are threatened by American forces or whatever, but North Korea fully understands that America cannot attack, I mean preemptive strike or whatever, cannot attack North Korea. That is already established uh, theory. Why? Because uh, all North Korean leaders or diplomats understand very well that if America want to make any kind of preemptive attack or prevention attack to North Korea, then they have to take care of how many numbers of Americans could be killed in this kind of uh, the military conflict. Now there are more than 200,000 American citizens living in South Korea. So that's why North Korea uh, thinks that this 200,000 American citizens living in South Korea are really a great hostage uh, to uh, North Korea. So they, the first they really believe that America cannot do any kind of military attack. The second thing is that the, they strongly believe that whatever North Korea does, China cannot give up North Korea. That is the North Korea's second uh, the principle. The third principle, whatever happens, whatever incentives are offered, North Korea should not give up its nuclear weapons. So this is, these are the three uh, the principles uh, which North Korean diplomats are strongly believe in. So you mentioned about the regime change. The word of regime change means a kind of, you know, outside uh, influence or outside physical, you know, attack to change 
uh, the regime in a certain country. Uh, so North Korea does not believe in that that kind of regime change could take place in North Korea. But Kim Jong-un is afraid of regime collapse. Regime collapse is different from regime change. He is afraid of any kind of regime collapse. Kim Jong-un believes that a regime collapse could be possible if the current, uh, the North Korea's uh, a free capitalist marketization is going on. If Kim Jong-un cannot uh, prevent the inflow of outside information like uh, South Korean movies or dramas, then I think one day uh, North Korea you see, can, system can be collapsed. If you read Rodong Simon, almost every week or every other week, there is a long article that North Korea cannot be collapsed by the American military force or nuclear weapons. But if North Korea allows the capitalist pro-job uh, propaganda or impure any elements of ideology, then North Korea can be collapsed. So this is not my uh, comments, but uh, this is the remarks coming from Pyongyang. Okay. Sorry, follow up, Peter, yes. So is John Bolton <coughs> part of the problem? Oh, uh, I think uh, uh, John Bolton, Bolton is part of solution because he really understands that North Korea, Kim Jong Un regime cannot give up uh, nuclear weapons. He strongly believe. I, to my impression, I think Bolton strongly believes in that theory. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got this gentleman here, and then to Jesse here. I try and get round if I can. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Nakano. I'm a freelance too. Uh, from your from your point of view, frankly, do sanctions really work? And do you believe tougher sanctions had Kim Jong Un's regime, or even making the regime collapse in the future? What do you think? I think that is a very good question. You know that a few weeks ago, Kim Jong Un sent a letter to uh, President Trump, and President Trump called it a beautiful letter. <laughs> So why, why Kim Jong-un sent a letter to President Trump? Because, because of that uh, sanctions. If, you know, paradoxically, if you look at the current reality, North Korea's nuclear ICBM missiles now are one year and a half old, right? And on the meanwhile, there are no any further escalation or any further tightening of sanctions. So North Korea's nuclear missiles and the sanctions are going parallel. So as long as this current trend is going on, Kim Jong-un can stand, can endure these current sanctions. That's why he understands very well that before the third summit, Trump stopped all Tight further sanctions from America. In March, there was a report that President Trump's aides proposed Trump to add more sanctions. What I was told by Americans that there are now 140 possible sanctions are in the waiting list. But President Trump said no, no for the sanctions, just keep the current UN sanctions as it is. So Kim Jong-un is very happy with that. So by sending a kind of letter to President Trump and by continuing giving a kind of hope of success of third summit, he wants to keep this kind of current parallel. So my opinion is that if America is happy with this kind of current parallel. America cannot force Kim Jong-un to give up its nuclear weapons. As long as the North Korea's nuclear missiles are alive, I think America should increase its sanctions, should tight more sanctions, more sanction measures should be taken. So. If the current level of sanctions are continuing, Kim Jong-un regime can endure. And that is one of the reasons Kim Jong-un visited Russia to discuss this matter, Putin. This is the reason why 
he invited Xi Jinping to North Korea today. And if you look at the Chinese policy, Chinese current policy is double stopping. What does that double stopping? As long as North Korea does not carry out nuclear tests or ICBM tests, the China also wants the American side not to do any joint military choice, nor for the escalation of uh, sanctions. So Chinese policy actually confirms with North Korea's current you know, the policy. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a Jesse now, and then yourself here, and <laughs> one of you two. <laughs> so Jesse, so here you are. Hi, thank you for coming. Jesse Johnson with the Japan Times. Um, my question is, Prime Minister Abe has said that he'd meet Kim Jong-un without conditions. But um, my question is, what, what conditions or environment are necessary from Kim Jong-un's perspective? Mm, uh, oh. Very interesting question. Prime Minister Abe uh, showed a great interest in uh, having a summit uh, with the Kim Jong-un. And on the meanwhile, Kim Jong-un is also interested in meeting uh, Prime Minister Abe. That, that, that is for sure, because as a new leader in this region and the youngest leader in this region, Kim Jong-un can only accomplish his the leadership and legitimacy by meeting all the important leaders in this region. Now, he met all of them, except Prime Minister Abe. So maybe not this year, but in his long goal of to become an influential leader in this region, he is willing to meet Prime Minister Abe. There is no doubt about it. But on what condition? That is the question. Because in North Korea and uh, Japan relation, North Korea strongly believes that Japanese government has outstandings to pay. Japanese government has not carried out Pyongyang declaration, which was signed between Kim Jong-il and Prime Minister Koizmi. So that's why if Prime Minister Abe wants to meet Kim Jong-un, they think that Japanese government should do something in advance to show the sincerity of implementing that Pyongyang declaration signed between Koizmi and uh, Kim Jong-il. So what does that mean? If Japanese government indicates any kind of economic or humanitarian aid in advance, then I think Kim Jong-un will take uh, that offer. But if there is no any immediate or upcoming, you know, the benefits for Kim Jong-un to meet Prime Minister Abe, I don't think Kim Jong-un uh, will meet the Prime Minister Abe in the near future. So the question is how much and what and when Prime Minister Abe can deliver to make that summit happen. And just a reminder for the questions here that we're going to uh, prioritize the working journalists with the green lanyards. So sorry if you're wearing a yellow one, but we try, try to keep it to the working journalists. Mr. Tay, my name is Patrick Welter with German newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, you talked about the fear of Kim Jong Un of regime collapse. So I wonder. I'm not sure how good your connections are still to North Korea, how much information you have. But can you tell us what is the effect of the sanctions on the economy in North Korea? And mm. how close is the economy to some kind of collapse of the regime? Mm. And what does it mean in that respect that Kim tries to contact Russia and China? What could they give him economically to, uh, to help to prevent a regime collapse? Yeah. First of all, 
You can easily uh, witness that there is a so much frequent change of army generals in North Korea's military leadership. If you uh, review what happened to all those four-star generals in the past six or seven years, for instance, the Minister of North Korea's uh, uh, defense, uh, the uh, generals uh, in the most top leaderships are changed every, almost every. So this kind of frequent change in the military and secret uh, the police service are unprecedented in the past seven decades of North Korea's history. And whenever there is any a slight failure in policies, Kim Jong-un almost, you know, the changes his people or openly criticize the followers around him. After the Hanoi's uh, uh, the failure, Kim Jong-un uh, reviewed uh, very strongly all the police lines, especially the inter-Korean police line, as well as uh, diplomatic, uh, the, 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 the police line as well. Now, the, inter the people who are engaged in inter-Korean relations now are almost the paralyzed because of this Hanoi failure, and all North Korean embassies worldwide are just uh, paralyzed uh, because of this. Uh, even in the recent uh, the news reports that even the State Department and the people in America uh, uh, are in difficulty, even have a telephone conversations with the people in North Korea's mission in New York. So that's why now Kim Jong-un is reviewing the whole policy process of diplomatic service as well as inter-Korean relations line. So this kind of frequent change of the people in his leadership shows that he is uh, in fear of the people around him. Uh, that, that is the first uh, uh, the indication. Uh, for the, you asked about the economic sanctions. Of course, economic sanctions uh, are creating a lot of difficulties to Kim Jong-un regime. Uh, but uh, my argument is that it is not enough to force Kim Jong-un to finally give up its nuclear program. If we want to make him to finally give up his ambition, I think more sanctions are needed. And your question is what China and Russia can do. Uh, in the past, last year and this year, I can witness that there are a lot of loosening measures taken by Chinese side in terms of trade uh, with uh, North Korea. According to UN uh, sanctions, Chinese side should send back all North Korean uh, resident workers back to North Korea before the end of uh, December. So. I don't think that new work permits are issued to North Korean workers by Chinese authorities. But on the meanwhile, now North Korea and China is looking for a new way to avoid these UN sanctions. For instance, if North Korean workers want to get a work permit, then the work permit allows them to work more around uh, the 90 days in China. If they stay in China less than 90 days without any official work permit, they are allowed to do their jobs in China. So now North Korea is making several shifts to change their North Korean workers frequently in the city's borders with North Korea. So if China sends back every month, with one team to another, change these teams, actually it is not against uh, the UN sanctions. That is, so there is a freak to, frequent change of North Korean workers. Another thing, one very interesting is that last, the, in 19, uh, uh, no, in 2017, Russian government announced that the numbers staying in Russia is around uh, 30,000. 
But at this year, Russia, uh, the Rush, the North Korean workers staying in Russia is around uh, uh, seventeen thousand, uh, more or less. So, this means that half of North Korean workers were already uh, expelled or left. Uh, Russia, according to Russia's official announcement, but is it true? Is that number believable? I don't think so. If 15,000 of North Koreans return to North Korea this year, then it is really a great number to North Korea. That kind of news can be very easily spread nationwide in North Korea. But so far, there was no news from North Korea coming out that any North Korean workers were expelled or returned from Russian's work site. So I strongly believe that Chinese and Russian governments are playing games with this uh, UN sanctions. So I don't think that there is any decrease of North Korean workers working in uh, Russia or China. So the monies are still channeling into North Korea by these North Korean workers. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, so this woman here, please. And then we'll come to George. I'm gonna try and get around to everyone if I can, but it might be difficult, so apologies in advance. Katrin Erdmann from ARD German Radio. Um, I would like to know, what do you think about help from South Korea? They are just sending tons of rice to it. Is it the right way uh, doing, uh, due to the food shortage in South North Korea? No. Uh, it, it is one of really a uh, political issue inside uh, South Korea, whether it is the right time to send a food aid to North Korea after the recent North Korea's uh, the missile uh, test launch. So uh, as far as I think the food uh, aid policy uh, by South Korea to North Korea, my uh, uh, the idea is that this kind of, of food aid by South Korea to North Korea should not be related uh, to any kind of uh, nuclear denuclearization, the process, or any kind of political uh, purposes. Uh, North Korea has been uh, uh, the receiving, receiving country for food aid from international community for the past 20 years. To my impression, I think North Korea is the only country which continues to receive food aid for over 20 years. So this kind of uh, North Korea's food uh, shortage problem is not just a this year's or last year's problem. It's a long, you know, the chronical uh, structural problem. So in face of this kind of the food shortage problem, I think uh, South Korean government should have a kind of you know, long-term strategic uh, the plan Something like, if they want to give the food aid, then the food aid should go to North Korea every year. Not, you know, this year or last year, whatever. It, there should be a continuation of flow of food aid to North Korea. But the current food aid is very controversial because the the current, uh, the, for instance, the first one was around 8 million donations to uh, World Food Program. Actually, that was decided in 2017, and it waited until now. So why this food aid issue all, all of a sudden, you know, uh, happened in South Korea? Because South Korean government looked for any kind of leverage to... Uh, uh, continue the process of dialogue and then all of a sudden they thought that this could be a new you know uh, the leverage to invite North Korea into a dialogue table so that's why food aid resumed and started and I think this is 
this kind of food aid really serves for any kind of political purpose. So that's why I think if it is a food aid, then it should be based on humanitarian principle. It should be not related to the progress of nuclear negotiations. It should be it should not be related to any kind of North Korea's missile launch or moratorium or whatever. I think continuation is most important. Okay, to George. And um, maybe then the gentleman in the blue there and the lady at the back. I'm working for Swiss Radio and Television. My name is Baumgartner. You, you mentioned fears of uh, Kim Jong-un uh, for uh, people around him. And uh, you didn't also um, explain how you left the, uh, your, the, your embassy in London when, when you defected. I would like to know a little bit more about it. But uh, what, what is your opinion about your uh, analysis or, op or your opinion about uh, the assassination of Kim Jong Nam in, in Malaysia? And do you think uh, Kim Jong Un uh, could be uh, removed from power by, by the military in the north? Thank you. Mm. Uh, first of all, under the current uh, military structure, uh, it seems almost impossible uh, for any kind of military coup or removal of Kim Jong-un by uh, military officers. North Korea has very unique uh, military uh, structure. It is very unique. For instance, North Korean army uh, must be uh, built for any kind of possible war uh, on Korean Peninsula. But if you look into the North Korea's army structure, the North Korean army is not actually structured for a po any kind of possible war. For instance, there is uh, the headquarter of uh, general staffs of North Korean army, but the headquarter of uh, general staffs can only control the 600 North Korean servicemen along the military demarcation line. So the generals working in the Ministry of Defense inside Pyongyang, they do not have any arms or pistols at all. They don't have any weapons. The Pyongyang, the, the Pyongyang city is controlled by Kim Jong-un's the bodyguard team. There, there is entirely another two different uh, army force. The forces which protect Pyongyang, which is around 200,000 forces, they are not related to the defense, the Ministry of Defense. So North Korean, all the North Korean military units are very much diversified. There was no something like, you know, uh, America or South Korean uh, style of military structure. So no army officer or general can organize all you know, army officers for any kind of possible uh, the military, uh, the coup. So that it is very difficult. Only Kim Jong-un can control all different uh, sections of uh, the military. So I don't think uh, military is possible and uh, you asked me about uh, the fear of uh, the leaders and also the Kim Jong-nam. Uh, you know, Kim Jong-nam, uh, before his death, uh, he didn't have any power. He didn't have any power in North Korean politics. Majority of North Korean people even uh, didn't know the existence of uh, Kim Jong-nam. Very few people, very few people knew that there was a guy uh, called Kim Jong-nam as the first son of uh, Kim Jong-il. So he didn't have any uh, the power. But the problem, he was a really a problem to Kim Jong-un. What Kim Jong-un continues to tell North Korean people is that he is the only successor in bloodline. So North Korean people now still, majority of North Korean people still understands that Kim Jong-un is the only son of Kim Jong-il. But Kim Jong-nam, when he was alive, he moved around. He made a frequent interviews with Japanese press or South Korean press or the other presses. He's pictures were frequently shown on medias. So the 
physical existence of Kim Jong Nam itself, you know, broad is really a great a threat. Itself is a threat to Kim Jong Un's legitimacy as the only successor of this bloodline. That's why Kim Jong Nam. Uh, should have returned back to North Korea and kept silent, or he was regarded as a kind of, you know, the physical subject who should be eliminated in any time soon. <clears throat> Does the same apply to Kim Jong-un's son, Kim han Sol? I think so, yes. So that's why, uh, that, that is the main reason why Kim han Sol is hiding. Unless uh, Kim Jong-un uh, cuts off all those unnecessary uh, the people in the bloodlines, I think this kind of the existence of Kim An Sol or the other people may undermine the Kim Jong Un's legitimacy as the only successor in the family bloodline. Okay, yeah, yes. <coughs> Thank you very much, Richard Carter from AFP. Um, returning to the theme of the uh, fears of Kim Jong-un of people around him, there was a lot of confusing and conflicting reports after the failure of the Hanoi summit about various officials being purged. There was even talk of executions uh, and hard labor, even for people as senior as Kim, uh, Kim Chol. Um, how credible do you think some of those reports were? And can you give us some insight into, into, uh, into that issue? Thank you. I don't think there was any uh uh, fiscal executions. Uh, there was a uh, policy reviews in those lines, and the North Korea is now restructuring uh, uh, those uh, peoples who were involved in the inter-Korean relations and uh, the uh, negotiations and policy lines. But I don't think there were any shootings or uh, executions, uh, whatever. I think. Uh, uh, in, according to North Korean terms, they are uh, politically criticized and uh, we call it a, a review of their lives or sent, uh, was sent to kind of, you know, uh, revolutionizing uh, education, but uh, that is just one or three months uh, work in the countryside and coming back to the post. I think that kind of very, uh, this slight, I think uh, the punishments were applied, but there were not like any uh, executions or purges or shootings happened in up uh, because of that Hanoi failure. Because Hanoi failure, Kim Jong Un was partly also responsible for that Hanoi failure. So if he completely turns this responsibility to other people, then I think it would undermine uh, his leadership and credibility. And Kim Jong Un knows that uh, very well, and that that is one of the reason I think there is no any that kind of severe. Or executions. So if you see and if you read the, those literatures coming from North Korea in the last months, there is a really clear, uh, I think, the change uh, in North Korea's policy with America and South Korea. Before uh, Hanoi summit, Kim Jong chol who was in charge of inter-Korean relations and negotiations with America. He was at the top and he was controlling the two lines. But after Hanoi summit, North Korean policy returned back to its original uh, stance. That means American policy uh, will be uh, the controlled and done by foreign ministry, while inter-Korean relations will be only done by uh, inter-Korean departments. So these two departments now, now are completely separated. Okay, thank you. We're actually at the um, finished time for this press conference now. Would you be able to ask, take one or two more questions? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay, let's try and keep these short. So the lady at the back first, and then, and then you, and then hopefully we can get round, but let's try and keep this short and sweet. Thank you. 
So, uh, hello, I'm Kamaini Singh with NHK World Japan Freelance. Uh, Mr. Tay, uh, congratulations, heart heartiest congratulations for defecting and starting a new life. And it's very sweet and soft and welcome to Japan. One thing I was wondering about you, yourself and your family, how do you see the future of yourself and your family in the long term? It's a very, it was a very, very brave decision of you. And if I were in your shoes, I, I don't know if I could do that. Mm. So really, all my respect and our respect from mm. the entire world for defecting. Uh, very brave. And please tell us about your future and your families. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. And to your family. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I think uh, uh, it is a very important to estimate how long Kim Jong-un regime can go on. And I think that maybe 10 years is too short. Uh, I, think, I don't think Kim Jong-un regime may collapse within 10 years, but I don't think Kim Jong-un regime uh, may continue another 20 years. So I think Kim Jong-un regime uh, will collapse uh, between uh, 10 and 20 years uh, time. And now I am in late of 50s, so if uh, I am able to live another 20 or 30 years, I think I will be able to walk back to my hometown. So in my rest of life, I'll try myself, um, I'll try my best to accelerate the process of this uh, internal uh, system collapse inside North Korea. I want to uh, uh, tell the true nature of uh, North Korea's, uh, the systems, the true nature of uh, Kim Jong regime, what he thinks on why he's so much obsessed with nuclear weapons so that America, South Korea and Japanese government take a right and correct decisions in the coming negotiations with the North Korea. And also, I will try my best to uh, educate North Korean elite uh, in my own way. Uh, now there are around 100,000 uh, North Koreans are in abroad. Of course, around 80% of those 100 North Koreans overseas are just normal workers, but there are also diplomats, uh, there are children, businessmen. So there are uh, many North Koreans who are able to access the internet and YouTube of all these uh, the uh, IT technologies. So I would like to, you know, tell. I would like to educate them as much as possible to change their minds, uh, and, and I want to educate that the current. The North Korea's, you know, the policy and way uh, is not safe North Korean people's and is, cannot save uh, North Korea's future. And I think if I try myself to change their minds uh, of North Korean elites, I think one day in the future, uh, I think there is a change. There will be a change. I strongly believe in that. Süddeutsche Zeitung, Neider, you just answered half of my question, which is about the current stability uh, of the regime. But <clears throat> you explained that the army will not be able to uh, topple the regime, uh, and the regime will not be uh, uh, changed from outside. Now, how do you imagine eventually an uh, implosion or a collapse of the regime? Because we don't, have, we don't know anything about dissidents as opposed to any other uh, similar country. Thanks. Yes, that's true. Uh, at this moment, I think uh, uh, there is there cannot be any immediate. I think uh, the people's uprisings or the military's initiative to remove uh, Kim Jong Un because military is not organized very well organized for that kind of purpose. But I am uh, looking for a change of generations. The people now around Kim Jong Un is. Uh, the average age of the people around uh, Kim Jong-un are either from uh, 60s to 80s. So uh, these people were actually 
were the one second generation of North Korean system, and these people are, were the other ones who actually contributed to some extent to the present North Korean system. But after 10 or 20 years, all of them may retire. And the people who are now in 30s and 40s, they will be in power. And the people in 30s, 40s, and 20s, they do not have any loyalty to North Korea's Juche ideology or the current system. So I think only the time, only the time can solve the problem. That is my strong belief. If there is a change of generations in North Korean military, I think one day, you know, when the current generals are all retired and 40s and the general is in, now in 40s or 50s, 30s, when they are in power, I think they do not have any solidarity with Kim Jong-un regime. The people who are now in 30s, once they, one, when they are in power, I don't think that they will continue to share the same ideology or uh, same thoughts with Kim Jong-un. I'm sure that they will say goodbye to Kim Jong-un. If you see the current, the change inside North Korea, the numbers of free markets are increasing. Kim Jong-un is trying to do whatever he can do to prevent the outside dissemination of information. But it turned out to be a failure. Every day, a lot of smugglings of South Korean films or dramas you know, are happening. If you see North Korean, the, the inside, uh, the education papers, now the people are openly selling South Korean products in the free market. Just five years ago, if you are open to sell South Korean products in free market, you are the immediate subject of public execution. But because of the money, the people and those enforcement forces are connected by bribery. So North Korean system is more and more corrupted. The people are not looking for ideology or success of the systems, but the people are looking for material, for money, welfare. I think that is the great change. And once the people started to look for a welfare, money, new information, I think that system cannot last another 20 years. That is my strong belief. Great. Do you have time for one final question? Oh, another final. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll definitely make this the last one. And you've been talking for quite a while now. <coughs> Siegfried Little, freelance from Germany. <coughs> what about the legitimacy of a nuclear weapon for the for the North for North Korean regime? It's I was said before it was every time said the the, if North Korea has nuclear weapon, it, it gives uh, the uh, regime in the, in the domestic policy a strongness. Do you believe in? Oh, a very good yeah, the question. Uh, the the last the 12th of June was the uh, first anniversary of uh, Singapore Agreement, and to honor Singapore Agreement on that day, Rodong Simon carried. Uh, one page front page article and that article was very interesting in that article it is clearly stated that what north korea achieved uh, in the last one year the first the achievement by, by kim jong-un according to that article was that kim jong-un turned the korean peninsula into a peace zone because of that strong war deterrent it is the first time in the Korean history that Korean Peninsula turned out to be a peace area. The second thing that North, because of that nuclear weapons, North Korea now has only entered in the rank of powerful states. So I think it, in other terms, Kim Jong-un is in early of 30s. The leaders he is meeting around is, are all either in 70s or 60s, 30 years older than him. But in that article he said that Kim Jong-un can meet anyone, 
all those powerful leaders of those strong countries are traveling long distance in order to show respect to Kim Jong-un, you know. So that is the reason how North Korea legitimizing the significance of nuclear weapons. And these nuclear weapons actually serves very well to justify all the failures North Korean system produced. North Korea is in economic difficulties. How they interpret it? Because of this nuclear program, North Korea is under economic sanctions, and that is the reason why North Korea has economic difficulties. They don't say there is any policy mistake or uh, policy failure. North Korea's military, now the conventional weapons of North Korea cannot be now even matched uh, with uh, South Koreans. Very obsolete North Korean weapons. But how Kim Jong-un can justify any kind of possible victory on Korean Peninsula because of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons in North Korea to Kim Jong-un can serve the only and last instrument to justify all the failures he made or his grandfather or his father made. Okay, and on that note, we're gonna have to wind this up. Um, a lot of very, very interesting comments made there, given a lot of journalists in this room, a lot of food for thought. Um, so thanks very much. And here is a, a one-year honorary membership of the FCCJ. I would like you to accept and come and talk with us more over food and drinks, if we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I think you should probably remain seated while Mr. Tay leaves. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Pleasure.